Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session of Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topic on Macker. And this afternoon in the news, we're hearing from the Jamaica Observer um, that there was a protest action in Manhattan, Jamaican stage protest in Manhattan, despite dissident group split. And this article was written by Harold Bailey, um, an observer writer, and he highlighted some very important factors. But let's get into the news, right? Despite reeling from a bitter feud within the ranks of the rival Global Jamaica the Diaspora Council, G Day, so it's G, sorry, it's GJDC, which has split to the organization and dampened its resolve, a small number of members staged a protest action against the Jamaican government in New York last Friday. So there was another protest action against the Jamaican government staged in Manhattan, New York, last Friday. Now, it seems like the protest action, the, not many people showed up to that protest because there is some amount of division among the leaders or the supposed followers of that group, of that distant group, the group that is desirous of transforming Jamaica and, you know, uh, wiping out corruption from that island. Now, it seems to me that, you know, Rattigan, that's uh, Wilfred Rattigan and the Stephen Francis and also Herb Nelson, they seem not to be on one page. There seem to be a lot of controversies surrounding them, controversies in terms of money, controversies surrounding leadership styles, right? And, you know, controversies surrounding misunderstandings. Because one of the things that we need to understand about Jamaica, Jamaicans and the Jamaican culture, is that wherever we are, we are going to be a divided people. We think we know it all. We think that our ideas matter and other ideas might not matter. We think that we are the smartest in the room, right? When we enter a room, we think that we are the smartest guys there. I remember they say that about Obama, that when Obama entered the room, he thinks, or he thought at the time when he was president, that he was the smartest guy in the room. So that is going to create a lot of divisions and it will not bode well for intelligent and for constructive conversations to happen, to take place. And I think that is what is happening with Rattigan and um, and also St the Stephen Francis and the Herb Nelsons. I understand that Wayne Lonesome, who is responsible, you know, for his taking a, a very bold stance against government, even though Wayne Lonesome is very PNP, right? He's very partisan in his analysis of the politics of Jamaica. And at this point, I don't think we should be partisan. We should understand, yes, you can have your political persuasion and you can you know, be loyal to your political party silently. But I think that we should be weighing the problems of Jamaica from a non-partisan lens so that we can be able to formulate and to craft objective, what should I say now, solutions, and come to an objective understanding, form an objective conclusion about what is happening in Jamaica, in modern Jamaica. Now, it is a part of um, our DNA also to be, you know, arguing over money. And I think there, was some argument concerning money and funds were put into an envelope. It seems that the funds were stolen and lots of different, you know, controversies surrounding that group of which Rattigan and Stephen Francis and Herb Nelson um, are a part. Now, that is something that is very, very sad because that group was just formed, right? And in no time, we find that it is being broken up into splinters which is very sad, but it really, really is a symptom of cultural defects in Jamaica, that we cannot come together and join our hands and hearts in unity. There has to be some amount of division. And I'm not saying that there are not divisions around the world, but I think that as a people, we are the most or one of the most divided in the world. And the politics has divided us over the years, and we have not sought solutions to looking in the mirror and say, 
this is what we need to do. And this is the reality. This is the truth. And we must accept that wherever the truth lies, we have to accept it. So whether we understand that Michael Manley was not a saint, we should understand that P.J. Patterson was not a saint. We should understand that Bruce Golding was not a saint. We should understand that Andrew Holness is not a saint. And none of our political leaders, including Edward Sierra, was not a saint, right? They are not saints. We must understand that they are humans who are vulnerable, who are susceptible to making mistakes, and who have made some very grave mistakes which have affected the path to our development. So that's something that we need to understand and we need to reflect on. We need to ponder these things, you know, as we go by daily. Now, addressing Friday's protest, attorney Wilfred Rattigan, founder of the One Jamaica Legal Defense Foundation and a key player in the dispute, said that they were they were there to give a voice to oppressed Jamaicans he claims are suffering from low wages, poor health care, service, corruption, crumbling infrastructure, and poor education. Right, and these lists, the lists that he has here are true. They're suffering Jamaicans. Most Jamaicans are suffering from low wages, poor health care. We can see that our teachers are leaving, poor health care, our nurses are leaving. And I understand recently that a gentleman at the Sangster International Airport, I'm not sure if he was, he's a citizen of Jamaica or a tourist, a foreigner, uh, I don't know, but he he died at the Sangster International Airport, and it is alleged that one of the reasons or the main reason for which he died was that there was no medical service of you know to have come for him and I'm like in the uh, for an ambulance that should have gone there to take him as quickly as possible to to, to see a doctor right to see a physician uh, as a result of that he he died and we know that there are shortages of ambulances and medical equipment in Jamaica as a result of this rigid austere IMF policy or program that we are a part of and that we're praising Nigel Clark to have directed, right? And these are some of the consequences of the austerity under which we find ourselves, right? Or in which we find ourselves, right? Austerity that is choking us, that is suffocating, suffocating the very life blood out of the Jamaica's economy, the Jamaican economy. And it's something that we have to come to grips with. And this is what I am here to say that oftentimes when you hear Wilfred Rattigan speaks and others who articulate our problems in Jamaica, they speak devoid of, there is no mention of geopolitics as if geopolitics doesn't matter. And geopolitics play 95% of the problems we're facing in Jamaica has to do with geopolitics and the role that geopolitics play in globalization. We have to look at the concept of globalization. Jamaica is no longer in the same reality. We're not facing the same realities as we faced in 1962 when we became independent. And I think people think that way. They think that we're just sovereign nation and our political leaders are the ones who are so corrupt and they're leading us into the, on the path of destruction. And to some extent, that is true, right? Maybe 30% of that is true. But we must understand that there are other factors, other global factors that impinge on our current reality and that prevent us from realizing our full potential and that we are not as free as we think we are. We are not as sovereign as many Jamaicans think we are. I think if we come to grips if we face these realities and begin to look at the global challenges, to look at the geopolitical challenges and articulate them and find you know, prudent ways of combating these geopolitical challenges, then perhaps we will begin to solve some of our problems. I do not know, as I've suggested before, if our problems really can be solved at this point. However, you know, where there is vision, you know, and where there's hope, I think we should continue to foster that hope, right? That, you know, because we can't live without hope. Humans cannot live without hope. Hope is food for the mind and the soul and the body to get things done. So we need to come together. We need to analyze in an objective manner, right? Um, in a non-partisan manner, these geopolitical challenges, 
that are beyond our power in some cases because it's got the IMF. We cannot control what the IMF does or does not do. In fact, there was an article that was written by Baron Buckley, I think, in the Jamaican Gleaner. I think it was written yesterday. I'm not sure if I can find that article that he wrote in which he was talking about the fact that Nigel Clark, who is heading to Washington to, to be one of the managing directors of the International Monetary Fund, he was suggesting yesterday in his in his article, you know, even though he congratulated the the Minister of Finance, Nigel Clark, for his appointment to that particular organization, but he was suggesting that one of the 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 measures, one of the mechanisms that the IMF uses when it, you know, employs these people at that level of the IMF organization, they have to go through what you call an orientation, you know, session uh, where they indoctrinate them into the IMF, you know, ideologies. <laughs> Maybe they sedate them, as it were, right? To letting them know that, you know, you know almost because many of these people don't have any conscience. Sometimes when I look at these people of color, from India, from Pakistan, um, from all over the world who represent the IMF to different, you know, developing nations, what we call the global south. And they just go there and they just, you know, without any conscience, they just force the government, foist upon the government austerity that they know is going to cripple the economy. And they have, you know, really no sort of moral persuasion no moral sense of no moral compass to say that this is something that is not going to be good for that economy because that is the way how they have been indoctrinated they have been brainwashed into becoming this imf representative and they think that they're important and they i'm sure they earn big all right they earn a big salary so that is what is happening so i think retigon and the people who are protesting who are making their protest need also to understand that we face some very challenging, right, insurmountable geopolitical uh, challenges that Rattigan and his crew, his team, are not addressing. I also find that Joseph Patterson, the president of the um, United International Congress, is that what it is? Right, whatever it is, what is the UIC? Um, when you listen to Joseph, Joseph is a passionate person, and I think that he's an intelligent man. However, Joseph needs to understand that Jamaica is not this country like Singapore um, in, in Asia. And the United States had different policies towards Asia than different policies towards a country like Jamaica and the Caribbean Sea and Latin America. A total different policy, Right towards them, even when Singapore was being developed, right? So he needs to understand that. And sometimes when he speaks about Singapore, it's almost like Singapore is this country that, you know, miraculously through the efforts of Lee Kuan Yew developed into this great economy. And I'm not suggesting here that if Jamaicans were more disciplined that we could not have done better but to suggest a country that is at the back door of the United States is going to, the U.S. is going to allow them to do what they want to do, is not going to work. And some of the, the policies that Singapore also implemented, if they were in the Caribbean, the U.S. would have undermined them. They would say, oh, it's communism, because we know that some of the policies that Michael Manley wanted to implement were policies that were healthy for the economy, but the U.S. did not want to happen, because the fact of the matter, they were accusing Jamaica of communism as if the United States is against communism, but that was a way to, you know, some sort of pretext given to suggest that we are the, one, the ones who control what you do and what you do not do. Because the United States used communism in the Cold War to prevent development of economies, whether it was in Chile or it was in um, Iran or it was in Guatemala, right? All of these economies and all of these prime ministers and presidents were undermined. Um, they were, you know, deposed, in some cases assassinated because of their stance in working the economy in the interest of their people. 
and not in the interest of transnational companies, transnational corporations, as Jamaica is doing. When you hear them talk about investment, that's what they're doing. So Joseph Patterson has to look closely at the geopolitical realities of modern Jamaica. He has to do that and not just to use Singapore as this sort of example as to where we are going, where, where, where we should be heading. Right? Much education needs to be um, undertaken where he's concerned as regards geopolitics and its challenges. I think that the University of the West Indies should create a course geopolitics and the Caribbean. And maybe Jamaica should have a course for itself because we are, we're such an anomaly in the Caribbean that we should have a course from maybe, you know, primary school to high school to university, geopolitics and Jamaica. I think we should be indoctrinated into geopolitics and the role that geopolitics play in the development or lack thereof in the Caribbean and Latin American region. I think we should, because I don't think most of our people understand, they grasp the concept of these challenges that we face, right? Something that we have to understand, something that we must begin to analyze and to become experts at. Right. And I think even our intellectuals or so-called intellectuals in Jamaica often do not flesh out. And that is why I was so very impressed with Dr. Thames. Is Dr. Thames uh, Maziki Thames? Am I pronouncing his name correctly? When he wrote about the IMF and the realities that confront Jamaica as a result of IMF policies. And this has been happening for decades. Even when you hear the same Dr. Um, Anthony Horton, is it Anthony Horton? Andre Horton. It's not Anthony, but Andre Horton speaks. When Andre Horton speaks about the IMF and the economic policies, he does not include the whole matter of geopolitics in what he's saying. Right? And it is crucial to having an understanding, an economic understanding, an economic awareness of what is happening in the Jamaican society, in the Jamaican economy, and why it is in the position that it is currently in. So the people can protest or they want to, they must be able to confront the geopolitics and what is happening. Now, they, um, Tavares, that's, what's his name again? They, I forgot his first name, but Tavares was there and he spoke. Tavares said that every Jamaican, despite their location in the world, should be concerned about crime in the country and he's right. So crime is a very important um, topic and, you know, fact is, important matter that was on their in their um protest agenda on their protest agenda it point, he pointed to the killing of eight people at cherry tree lane in clarendon in august as a clear indication that more serious measures need to be taken by the government to deal with the crime right we, you know, we, we have to take more more stringent measures despite the fault within the group the co-leader of the rival g j d c dr Rupert. Francis, he's not Dr. Stephen Francis, but Dr. Rupert Francis, I beg your pardon, has vowed that the effort to get the government to respond to their concerns will continue. He says here that this, this, this is Rupert Francis speaking. There are sufficient people who believe in what has been started and who want to be a part of our efforts. If it is that we have to look at where we are and reorganize, then we will, he says. But, you know, the fact is that we have to come together. Having a spattering of people there in the U.S. and dividing the diaspora, the diaspora as Wilfred Rattigan and Rupert Francis and others have done, is not going to solve the problem. We have to work together. We are not many. <laughs> you know, we have just about 300, 3 million in the U.S. diaspora and 3 million at home. So the, Jamaica, the Jamaican diaspora and the and Jamaicans at large, we are not many people and we're not powerful people, right? So we have to come together. Unity is strength. And if we come together, uniting our skills, our talents, you know, um, I think that we will be able to solve some of the problems. We're not going to solve all of them because at this point, I think we have long passed the Rubicon. 
and we are not going to be going back right now. But, you know, as I'm suggesting, we need to try as best as we can because we're thinking about future generations here. We tend to think about our generation, but we have to think about those who come after us. So it's going to, it's going to be messy, it's going to be spotty for them, but we have to do all that we can do, all that we can do to ensure that they have a world that they inherit, a world that is at least habitable. In Jamaica, that is at least habitable, but the trajectory on which we are treading at the moment, we're not leaving that, we're not leaving a habitable Jamaica for them. What we're leaving is a society that is filled with anarchy and lawlessness, right? Because the society is lawless. And that is perhaps what we need to work on first. We need to work on creating a law-abiding, lawful society where people, you know, obey the laws. And if they don't obey the laws, that there are stringent fines. We've got to go back to that society. That was a society that they tried to, you know, to enforce and to implement and to, uh, what should I say now, create during the pandemic, right? It was like the engineering of a new society, a new mindset, a new way of thinking that people had to go home and they had to tell your yard, right? And there was a lot of peace and tranquility there. So why can't we create, why can't we maintain that law and order, the law and order that we try to implement, even though for, you know, an unworthy cause, in my opinion, because it could have been handled better because we knew what we were doing, but we decided to take that sort of decision. And we embarked on that sojourn that, you know, has destroyed to some extent our economy also. Right. And the social re the realities that we're facing with crime and balance, all right, that also uh, has impacted our crime and balance of the lockdowns and all of that stuff, which I shall not be getting into at the moment. Right. Uh, so these are the points I want to say that the diaspora has to come together. The diaspora cannot do things on their own. And if they're going to you know, work to uplift Jamaica, they will have to move from the, you know, the stark divisions that we're seeing there and try to come together and to flesh out our problems and stop behaving as if, you know, everybody is the smartest person in the room because we are not and the problems really stand above us only god and joseph patterson has this idea that which god are you talking about right only the god of heaven and the founding fathers in the united states were very clear even though they were not ardent christians they were very clear on that that it is the the the, the, the god of the bible that when they look at history and they look at how history progressed and how religion has been a key element of a country's development or lack thereof, he realized that all the countries that seem to have been developed and had some amount of civility and decency, right? That they actually were tethered to the biblical Christian religion. Right, And that is where freedom comes from, because outside of God, there is no freedom. Right, And Professor Orlando Patterson, he has acknowledged that in his book, The Making of the West. Right, that, and, and Orlando Patterson is no, you know, avid Christian. I don't even think he goes to church. But he understands as an intellectual that the Christian religion, uh, particularly those Protestant nations, it, it, this idea of freedom, this idea of freedom is a misnomer. It's not something that was ever thought about in previous societies, except for the, the Jews, right? All societies did not believe in freedom. They believe in freedom for the oligarchy, for the minority, for the rulers, for the autocrats, but not for the ordinary man. And I think we have taken the freedoms since the Protestant Reformation 
very lightly. We have taken those freedoms very lightly and we have taken them for granted. And God is slowly but surely taking those freedoms away from us for us to come to our senses. But we will never come to our senses because we think that freedom lies in Washington, D.C. And it lies in our government granting us freedom. But if you notice the establishment clause of the United States Constitution, the amendment to the Constitution, the, 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 the Bill of Rights, right, suggests that these rights are, you know, natural, that they come from God. Governments are there to secure them, to reinforce them, to protect them, but they're not there to give any right to us. Where, where, whenever it comes to where, as far as freedom of speech is concerned, religion, right? Unnecessary search, right? All of these things are things we should be able to have. And no government should be telling us about misinformation and misinformation. Let people deal with that. Of course, if somebody is doing something that is causing a threat and hurting someone, you have to, the government is should intervene with the consent of the governed, right? But not for the government to be making decisions, telling us what we should listen to and what we ought not to listen to, because that sounds like a theocracy, right? So Joseph Patterson needs to reflect more about God and the state and the role that God needs to play in the state. And it's not just about any God because God does not share his throne with any other God. So it therefore, therefore, if we're gonna have freedom, we have to talk about the biblical Christian God, the God of the Bible, right? And it's not the Catholic understanding of because Catholic, Catholics don't have an understanding of freedom either because the Catholic religion is a monarchy also. It's a spiritual and also a temporal monarchy. Okay? So he's talking about which God, you know, were the founding fathers of the United States talking about his nonsense. Utter nonsense. Because they were clear. And if he should read more, he would understand that they were clear. Because they had done more reading than he ever imagined and would probably ever be able to, to read in his lifetime. Because we're so distracted. All right? So I think that those are the points I wanted to bring forward in today's presentation. I think we have to come together as a diaspora. Very important that we understand that we cannot at this moment become divided. We are too small in numbers and we are insignificant on the world stage, right? Jamaica is as a country is insignificant. I think that we think the culture because the culture has gone to the world and you know, most of which is decadent too, right? A lot of the culture that we say we are sending to the world is not healthy culture, if the truth be told, right? If the truth be told, it is not a healthy form of culture. It is a violent, ignorant culture that we have exported to the world for the most part. Right? for the most part. And we've got to come to grips with that. Much of what we celebrate is what should not be celebrated. And that is why we're having crime and violence because at one point, at one end, we're celebrating it with the Vibes Cartel and we're jumping and we're dancing. And you're going to see many people going to Vibes Cartel's concert come December or January. They're going to be going there. At the end of the day, they lament to the understand the, 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 the large homicide, the high homicide rate that is registered every every year in Jamaica. So we want to have our cake and eat it at the same time. We want to have, you know, um, crude, obscene lyrics played on the airwaves, right? Man a shaka, a man to kill man and all of that stuff. Yet, when it does play out in reality, in real life, why do you think music is so important in worship? Hmm? Because as you sing hymns, for example, it is a life lesson to be applied in your life. Master, let, oh master, let me walk with thee. You contemplate on the words and that is what helps you 
to walk with God. It's a song that helps you to walk with God and you want to draw closer to him. So words are powerful. And that is why music plays such a pivotal role in any liturgy. Without music, there's no worship. So when you are thinking about, oh, these are some words and you have to separate entertainment from real life, that's nonsense. Because when you have our young people just consuming that sort of lyric every day, right, then they're going to become valid. Because that is what is, that is what has inundated their minds. Violence, crudity, obscenity, right? This is what has really filled up their minds. And we are not coming to grips with that. We think that, no, it's just, you know, Vibes Cartel is the entertainer and Adija Palmer is the real guy. But the Vibes Cartel and Adija Palmer are the same people. <laughs> they might be playing different roles, right? But it is the same person. Let's not be confused or let Vibes Carter confuse you. Right? It is the same person. If he's advocating, if Vibes Carter is advocating violence in his music, Adija Palmer is advocating violence in his music. And something that you've got to understand if Andrew Tucker is advocating violence in his music, then whatever Monica I come up with for my name, that person or that Monica is also advocating violence. I don't care who, whoever you are, who, who, I, I don't care. That is what life is all about. And we find ourselves now because of the education system and this left-wing ideologies of this Marxist, you know, where we're going to be all equal in society and, you know, we can do whatever we want and we can become an agenda we want to become. That is the sort of indoctrinating and the sort of nonsense that is being taught in schools right now. So we find our societies thinking that we are going to just live in this world of illusion where we think that we, you know, we're here. But let me just end here by saying, unless the Lord builds the house, he or she who is building it is laboring in vain, right? Unless the Lord is the builder and designer of the house, he or she that engages in that building process labors in vain. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you would like and you'll share and you will subscribe to the channel. Remember now, I think I have 75 5% or 74% of the viewers of this channel have not yet subscribed. So what is it taking you? Subscribe. Remember now that is how you are going to send the video. You're going to help to send the videos to the members of the world. You know, because remember now, if you don't have enough subscribers and you do not view, you don't have enough viewers, then the videos and likes also then the videos will not be shared on the platform. So it's up to you. You need to make a difference. It's 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 free. Right? It takes nothing but to just hit a like button or to hit a subscribe button right? so that the videos can be shared with as many people around the world. Thank you so much for joining. I hope to see you in another video. Ciao.